why don't we just pray and just commit this time to the Lord and I just believe that there's an impartation that's happening because the words here and God's word is life to those that find its health to all our flesh. It's got an amazing ability to transform whatever it comes in contact with. And so Heavenly Father, we want to thank you right now, Lord God, that you're here by your spirit. Holy Spirit, we just thank you that you are here in the earth as the teacher of the church. You're here as the one that's to, Lord, come to lift up people, Lord, to allow us to see, Lord, who you've created us to be. And so we just open ourselves to you right now. We just declare that our mind is alert, that our body is coming into line. It's not going to fall asleep. Our, our mind is able to receive the incorruptible word of this living God. And we thank you, Lord, for transformation that happens, Lord, that you sent your word into any areas of darkness, Lord God, that don't uh, have a possession of the word in our minds and our hearts and our lives and our bank accounts. We just thank you that that word is going into those areas even right now. And, Lord God, it is transforming those things into the same image, Lord God, that you have for it. And so we just thank you for that word right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So the victory culture, that was, that's what we've been looking at for the last we were, we're on week five, and uh, we're looking at our Word of Faith foundations. And uh, we sort of said that, I mean, I've been trying to cover all of those points that Stephen had on his, um, his definition list, but we haven't done that quite yet. And so um, one of the things that as Word of Faith people, we, um, we emphasize the integrity of God's Word. Not only do we trust and rely on God, but we trust and rely on the integrity of of God's word, and so we're going to look at that for a few minutes before we continue uh, looking at our um, authority as a believer. You see, the word of God is just a, an amazing thing. In fact, some of the stuff that Stephen put down there—that we believe that God's word is alive, that it has inherent power in it, that is released when spoken. It's alive. It's a living substance. Now, it's not alive in, the, in, in this book here like that. But as soon as we put that word in our mouth, the power of God is released, and it will bring forth exactly what it says. We believe that. We absolutely emphasize the life and the power that is within the word. And so we also emphasize positional truth, who we are in Christ, uh, what we have, what belongs to us, our authority as believers. And so all of this, all of those things that we emphasize is found in this, in this book, in this Bible. Every single thing is found in this word. Hallelujah. And so the integrity of God's word is just in incredible for us to understand. It's just not a book. It's, the, it's, it's God's word. It's God breathed. But I'll just put it down there right now. And so I also said here that if I'm going to build my life, and I said this 30 years ago, if I'm going to build my life upon this word, if I'm going to get my hopes way out there, if I'm going to put my faith into this word, I've got to know that it's going to come through. I mean, I don't want to spend the last 30 years and realize I come to the end of this thing and, and, and that it's got no substance to it. And so I want to know, I want to ask, and God doesn't mind us asking, is this word really uh, got everything and it's going to produce exactly what it says? Or otherwise, is it just a history book and am I just wishful thinking and I'm kind of wishing on a star that something's going to come true? And so we need to be able to ask and have a look at that and see what this word of God is. Does the word have integrity? Is it the rock that Jesus said that we could build our lives upon? Is, is it the rock? And so I want to spend uh, just a few minutes having a look at the word, and I've given you a whole lot of scripture. It's not exhaustive about what God says about his word and what he has to say about um, this living word. You see, Jesus said in, in Matthew 16, 18, he said, upon this rock, the rock of revelation knowledge, I'm going to build my church. That's you and I. He says, and the governments of hell will not prevail against it. Upon the word of God, he is going to build. He's going to build our lives upon the word. Every single one of us, depending how much word of God is in your life, is how much God is able to build his kingdom inside of us. And so Jesus said that this word is the rock of rocks. Hallelujah. Not only that, but God has said that he has sworn by himself and that he is never going to go back on his word. God has actually sworn by himself over this word. And he said, I'll never go back on my word. I'm not going to. You see, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. Has he not spoken? Has he not said it? And will he not do it? Has he not spoken? And will he not make it good? And so when our God has spoken something to us, God is bound by himself to make that word good. 
And so we're going to have just a look at some of this word about what he says about it. And so that we can just say, yeah, if I find something in this Bible, if I find something in the victory program or in the prayer booklet that is a promise of God, then I know that I can put my hopes in that, I can put my faith in that, I can draw a line in the sand and say, devil, this far and no further. You don't come near me. And so I need that confidence to be able to stand against the spirits of darkness. You see, because he knows the word. But he wants to know whether you know it. And according to whether we know what the word says will be how much of God's victory we're going to walk in in our lives. And so this word, the word of God, it's always existed. God and his word have always existed. And God and his word are one. You know, when 1 John, he, um, um, John talking, and it says, In the beginning was the word. In the beginning. Well, when was that beginning? Who knows? But in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, the word. And without him, the word, nothing was made that was made. And so we have a look here. We're talking about Jesus Christ. It's explaining Jesus Christ. And before Jesus Christ became Jesus Christ, he was God in the beginning. And his name was called the Word. And so when we love this Word, we are loving Jesus Christ because in the beginning was the Word. Jesus Christ, if you would like. That's, his hum that's the name of his humanity. So in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and there was nothing made that was made without him, you see. In him was life. In him the word was life. In the word is life. And that life is the light of man. And that light shone in the darkness and the darkness could not overcome it. And so we see this word of God that the darkness, when we speak it out, it cannot overcome the light of God's word. So I think, my God, this word... We just send it out and the darkness can not overcome or comprehend that. And so we find that this word is an amazing gift that has been given to us. It says that he, he, he the word, was in the world, that he, Jesus Christ, he, the word, was in the world and the world was made by him and the world did not, did, did, did not receive him. But to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become sons of God. Then verse 14 turns around and says, And the word, here it says, it confirms that the word became flesh. The word God, he became flesh and he dwelt among us. And we beheld him as the glory of the, of the Father. And so we find here that God is saying, This word that you, are, you and I are building our lives upon, it's God. It's the word of God. And when we put this word in our mouth and we declare it out of our mouth, we put it in our heart and declare it with our mouth, it is going to speak, bring forth the same thing that God, when he speaks, this word brings forth. Praise the Lord. And so God, in the beginning, he spoke. When we said, remember, there was darkness on the face of the deep? And that's, that's another story all there. It said, and God spoke. The word was released into that darkness and it brought forth light. We find in Hebrews, it talks about, uh, Hebrews 11, it says that the worlds were framed by the word of God. The worlds were framed by the word of God. And so we can take this word and we can frame our world with the word of God. What else does it say? It says God will never go back on his word. He says my word is forever settled in heaven. So if God's word is forever settled in heaven, God's waiting for someone on the earth to say, God, that settles it. That's it. You've said it. That settles it. I am the healed. I am the prosperous. I am the head, not the tail. I am above. I'm not beneath. Lord God, Satan may come in one way, but he's got to flee before me seven ways. So Satan, you want to come? Well, you're going to be splitting seven ways. You see, knowing this word brings a boldness inside of our lives. You see, God says, I've sworn by myself. I'm not going to go back on my word. He says, I am watching over my word to perform it. And so God is wanting to perform his word on the earth in our lives. But he's waiting for someone to speak the word. And when we speak it out of our mouth, then God is watching. Then he can bring that thing to pass in our lives. And so I think, my gosh, what else does he say? He says, the grass withers, the flower fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. 
Okay, and so this is going to be around when all this, when this earth folds up and God makes a new heaven and a new earth, the world, you know, the world that we know right now, gone, the word's going to still be here. And so when we're building our lives, we're building our families, we're building our world, we're building our cities and our nations on the word. This incorruptible. It goes on to say here that heaven and earth pass away, but my words will never pass away. Here, God's creative power, Isaiah 55, it says, And so is my word that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it will prosper. In fact, in the NIV, it says it will accomplish what I desire and it will achieve and the purpose for which I've sent. And so when we start sending God's word out, it is going to accomplish some things. Now, we can't see it because the Bible says that the words are spirit and their life. And so sometimes the Christians, they're getting so caught up in the natural that they speak the word and that they don't see things coming to pass. But you see, in the book of James, it says that the tongue is like the rudder of a ship. And, and you have one of these big tongue, tr- um, tongue ships that are moving along and they're just cutting water, got tons of cargo in them. It says the tongue is like a rudder of the ship. And, it's, and whichever way you turn that tongue is whichever way your life is going to go. And so we start to speak the word and people get very discouraged because they speak the word. They don't see things happening happening in the natural right away but you see like James was talking about that ship he said the pilot he just turns the the wheel and the rudder will turn on the back out on the back of that ship now it's going to carry on cutting water for three kilometers or so it's not going to change any direction but you keep the rudder right there where the word is and that whole ship is going to turn right around and see we just keep our tongue and keep speaking the word over our lives, whatever that area is in our life, and it will turn that thing around. It's just a matter of time, just keeping on applying that to our lives. It said here that the word of God is living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. You see, Ephesians talks about the word of God being a shield, it being the sword of the spirit. It's our breastplate of righteousness, that our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel, our helmet of salvation. Hey, listen, guys. This is what the word is. We can build our lives upon the integrity of this word. We're born again of incorruptible seed. How? By the word of God that lives. Incorruptible seed. And so the the seed of God's word, or God's word is like a seed. It's incorruptible, which means we sow that word. And Jesus talked about the sower sows the word. And so we can sow this word into any area of our life. We take whatever way we want to. I mean, if you need finances, you need your finances, turn right around. Then you take the word of God, scriptures talking about your finances. You just start to speak that word into that area. Start to sow the seed of God's word. And it will bring forth that harvest in our lives. It, it has to. It's the bread of life. Jeremiah talks about your word being like a fire. It's like a hammer. And so the word can come in in areas of, of, of challenge that we have and it'll just burn that, that, that up. It'll just smash down like a, like a hammer. Any strongholds in our thinking, we send the word out, it'll just smash it down. It's magnificent. Jesus Christ, the living word. And God says, I love this one, he said, I have magnified my word even above my own name. That's how much our dad thinks of his word. That's how much our Father thinks of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I've magnified my word, my son, even above my name. My word. And so the idea is the human beings on the earth that we take a hold of this word and we magnify it above our names. We magnify it above the name of sickness. We magnify it above the name of disease, of cancer, of poverty, of lack. We take that word and we just magnify it. We exalt it above every other name. Every other name. Jesus Christ has the name that's above every other name that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow. We make everything bow to the word of God. That's our job. That's our assignment. Praise the Lord. And so how do I know that I'm free? The word tells me I'm free. How do I know that I'm I'm healed? Because the word tells me by his stripes I am healed. How do I know that I have freedom and victory over Satan? Because the word says God's delivered me from the powers of darkness. And that you have authority to trample on snakes, scorpions, over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. The word tells me that. And that word gives me confidence to be able to stand in the evil day. And right now we are in an evil day. Why? Because Satan's still on the earth. That's the only thing that makes it evil. I mean, I'm having a good time because he's not in my world. And I don't want him to be anywhere near my world. He comes at different times, and we're going to have a look at that in a moment. He's going to come around and try and get into our world. We just take a hold of the word, push him out. That's all. We do that, just flick it off. 
I mean, that's, that's what God wants us to do. Praise the Lord. And so to walk in the authority as believers, we must know and we must trust in the integrity of God's word. That is our foundation. And so last week we were having a look at this, at, at our authority as believers, and we just started to look at that. And as I said, I've got a six-week series here talking about whose planet is it anyway. Uh, and, and that will cover a lot of the stuff. I mean, I, I spoke about some of it last week and um, talking a, few, a, a bit about it this week. But I mean, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word. So I encourage you to grab a hold of CDs and just listen to this again and again and again. Every time you listen to it, faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. And so our faith, it will come. When you're hearing right now as I'm speaking God's word, faith is coming for the authority of the believer. Faith is coming for you to believe in the integrity of God's word. It's here right now, just grabbing it. It's mine. Just like Martin was saying, it's mine. Praise God. And so we found out, let me just quickly recap and we'll then we'll carry on going from where we were last week. God's plan from day one was that man would walk in authority in the earth. That was, his, that was his plan. He said, let's make man in our image after our likeness. And God said, let him have dominion over everything over all the works of our hands and so we found out that part of that assignment uh, that Adam had was to to uh, increase to multiply to fill the earth and we find out let me just draw this here his job was to 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 to, to do that and God said that in the garden he said I want you to guard that world he said I want you to guide this this world I want you to care for it you are the gatekeeper of this house and uh, Satan knew, I mean, not Satan, Adam knew what he was supposed to be doing. He was not ignorant. In fact, the New Testament says that Eve was deceived, but, Satan, but, but Adam was not deceived. He knew exactly what he was doing. And so when Satan came into the garden and he gave his word, we find that Adam chose Satan's words over God's words. And we find the fight on the earth right now is the same fight. It's choosing between life and death, blessing and cursing. And God said to Joshua, you choose. I'm putting before you. Look, this is what's before you, life and this death. And then Joshua said, I'm going to choose life that me and my household will live. And so we choose that. And so Adam had that choice, life or death, blessing or cursing. And he chose the curse. He chose death and, he, uh, and allowed that death came onto the planet. Over all men, Romans says that this beautiful planet here then got filled with darkness. Now this is, oh, look at this. I need some big thick pens. Okay. I'm, I went down to the shop and asked them for some thick pens. I'm going to bring a paintbrush <laughs> and do it. And so we find that the Bible says that through, through Adam, sin entered the world, the curse entered the world, death entered the world. And when God came to them, and, 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 and this is just a side, when God came to them in Genesis 2, and God said, um, um, uh, Adam, you, the ground is cursed because of you, and Eve, your womb is cursed. Now people think that God came in and that God cursed them, punished them for disobeying. No, Adam let the curse into the earth, and God was saying, because of what you've done, the ground is now cursed. Eve, because of what you've done, your womb is now cursed. You were to bring forth blessing, but now you're going to labor to bring forth. Adam, you were supposed to rule the earth with the words of your mouth, and everything was going to bring forth by your word, but now you're going to have to toil it, and it's going to be hard work. But I didn't design that. And so God didn't bring the curse or curse them. The curse was in the earth. They brought that curse on, and God was just telling them now what's happened. And dying, you have died, you've put death into the whole planet. And so we find that God worked with man through the covenant, and he worked through that covenant. Why, and why was that? Because God needed his word in the earth. You know, like in the, dark, in, the, in the beginning, darkness was over the face of the waters, and God spoke and said, let there be light, and light came. And so God is, God's word is light. He finds a man to speak his word into the earth, and then all of a sudden the light of God's glory starts to shine again in the earth. And that's why God asked them in the Old Testament, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night so that you may make your way prosperous. Then you're going to have good success. And so what we find here is when God had Abraham and he says, did you walk through the land? He says, in the place of your foot, wherever your foot shall tread. Oh, this is not working. Wherever your foot shall tread. If you can just imagine if that was darkness. And wherever your foot treads, you walk through the land, Abraham, walk through it, up and down through the land. I have blessed you. And he walked up and down that land with a blessing. And wherever the feet, his foot tread, the blessing of God was on that land. The curse could not operate. And so wherever you and I are walking right now, the curse has got to move out the way. The curse is still on the earth. 
But when I talk around and I say, thank you, God, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm the head and not the tail. Wherever I'm walking, there's just blessing. There's just paradise. There's just life. Darkness has to flee. Darkness cannot overcome the light. So I just speak the word and wherever I go, I'm blessed. Whatever I put my hands to is blessed. Whatever I do is prosperous. The words of our mouth. We are blessed. Hallelujah. And so Jesus Christ came to undo the works of the devil. He got the authority back. And the first thing he does is he turns around and he gives that authority to us, the church. And he says, now you go with that authority. And, and it's amazing because that word go, he says, you go and preach the good news. You go and let the light of the glorious gospel shine on the earth. And then God says, you open your mouth and let me fill it. And so the church went out and she started to preach light. She started to preach life. And you find that wherever the church went, the nations were turned around. And you find the Western nations were founded upon the glorious gospel. They've left her right now in one generation. They've left Jesus Christ. And you see the curse coming back into the nations. But the nations that have had God as their God, they are blessed, prosperous, to be envied. That's what God said. And so that word go is a powerful word because it brings forth the blessing of God, the life of God, heaven on earth. And so we find out here that uh, this, this authority that God has given to us has caused us to be above and not beneath, to be the head and not the tail. Now, the Apostle Paul, he was the one that was carrying the mystery of this glorious gospel. It wasn't Peter, it wasn't any one of the apostles. God took Paul to heaven and he showed him the whole plan of salvation. He showed them the age of grace, which is this last 2,000 years. He showed them the authority of the believer. And he came, he came back to the earth after this vision. He said, I was a, there was a man once, whether in the spirit or out of the spirit, God knows. He said he was taken up to the third heaven, so we know that God's heaven is in the third heaven. And he saw, unspeakable, he sort of saw the mysteries, unspeakable things, which it's not possible for a human person to utter, which means it was just so amazing, the plan of God for our lives. And he said, see, there was given to me the mystery of the gospel. And we find out that he didn't confer with any of the other apostles about this, about this plan of salvation for us with the authority of the believer. He was preaching to the Gentile nations. And one of the prayers that he prays, and you'll find it in Ephesians, and you'll find it in the book of Colossians, and he's, and he's praying that you and I, the church, would get a hold of who we are in Christ, of what our authority is, of the power that is available to us. And he said, I cease not to give thanks for you making mention of you in my prayers. He says, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory would give to us the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of revelation and the knowledge of him, that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened. Our, our understanding is our mind. Our spirit already knows who we are. Our mind needs to be enlightened. The eyes of our understanding be enlightened that we may know the hope of his calling. What is this calling? What is the riches of the glorious inheritance which is in the saints? But we would know the exceeding greatness of his power which is towards us who believe and that power is compared to the power that God used when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality or might or dominion and every name that is named. And he gave him, Jesus Christ, to be the head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all and is in you all. And so Paul was praying this prayer and I want you to notice in verse 2, it says that God has made him, that God raised him up. And what does it say here? It says, and he's put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Now, if we are part of the body, Jesus Christ is the head and we are the body. And if God has put all things under his feet, that means all things are under our feet. Because the body and the head are together. We're not separate. Now, he's the head and he's in, he's in heaven, but we are the body on earth. And Satan is under our feet. God has put all things under our feet. So that means Satan does not have any authority, even the youngest believer, even if you were the little toe on the body of Christ, Satan is still under your feet. As soon as a person gets born again, Satan is under their feet. Now, they may not be exercising it. They may not know it right now. But Satan, the truth is, he's under our feet. 
And Paul was praying that we would know this. There's no addiction. There's no poverty. There's nothing. He's given us the name that's above every other name. And Paul's crying out, God, I pray daily that this church would get a hold of this. You see, faith comes when we hear. Well, I mean, what are you standing against now? Is there something that's hassling you? It's under your feet. Just speak that word. Allow the Holy Ghost inside you to confirm that word with signs following. Hallelujah. Jesus confirmed that again. He said, I've given you authority to trample on snakes, scorpions over all the power of the end. Nothing, nothing shall by any means hurt us. Nothing. Another scripture to confirm that, that he's raised us up together with Christ, made us sit together in heavenly places that in the ages to come, he would show you the exceeding greatness of his power in us. And so this is who we are. We have this authority in the earth. You see, God right now, Jesus Christ, he left the earth. He said, you are my body on the earth. Now you go. And what did he do? He made us the doorkeepers of this earth. So Jesus Christ, he's made us the doorkeepers of the earth, the body of Christ, the church. We are the doorkeepers of this earth. Look what he says here in Matthew 16, 19, in the New Century Version. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, I will. He's saying I will because he hadn't been raised from the dead yet. He was still on the earth as, 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 as Jesus the man, but he has now raised from the dead. And so we could say, I, I have given you the keys. All right? And so I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, what does that word keys mean in the Greek? Keys means the, the keeper of the keys has the power to open and to shut. We have the power on this earth to open and to shut. It denotes, in the Greek, it denotes power and, and, and authority. And so we have the authority to open and to shut the door on Satan. We have the power to do that. We have the authority, as we learned last week. Exousia was the authority. We have the authority to open and to shut the door on Satan. Not only that, but we have the power to open and shut the door on the presence of God, the life of God, the word of God. When the church is doing well in the earth, the earth's doing well. And so it's our responsibility to be blessed, happy, prosperous, to be envied. Because we, when we, the church, are operating as the church, the light of the world, Jesus said, I am the light of the world, but then he turned around and he said to the church, you are the light of the world. Nobody that has a light is going to stick it over, over, over a, uh, what do you call it? Under a bushel. He says, you can stick it up right high for all the world to see. If you think of the education system, it was started by Christians. The nurses were started by Florence Nightingale. She was a Christian. A lot of the amazing um, humanitarian things that have gone on on the earth were started by somebody who was a Christian who started to shine on the earth. And in our last generation, the last 40 years, we've just seen the church has been hiding under a bushel. But God has been stirring her up in the last while to get back up there and start shining this glorious gospel. Start shining. God says that you will prosper. He said, he said, he said when, the, when, when it goes well with the church, the city is going to prosper. We're bringing the atmosphere of God. So we open or shut the door. To God, we open and shut the door to Satan. Wow, that's pretty huge that I've got the keys. You see, when Jesus rose from the dead, he says, I've got the keys of the kingdom. He's given the keys to the earth, on the earth to us. So I have the keys. I have the keys in my own private world that I open or I shut the door. If we get a hold of that. He goes on to say, let's read the rest of that verse. It says, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now look at this. The things that you don't allow on earth will be the things that God does not allow. And the things you allow on earth will be the things that God allows. Now, that's pretty huge. You see, this deals with this, this teaching on sovereignty. Oh, well, if God allows it. No, 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 no. It's nothing to do with God. This is our planet. You go have a look at heaven if you want to and see how, what God allows on, 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 in heaven. 
And God says that we're supposed to pray, or Jesus said, you're to pray, kingdom of God, come on earth as it is in heaven. Will of God be done on earth as it is in heaven. So if we want to have a painting and a picture of what earth's supposed to look like, go have a look at what heaven looks like. There's no sickness, no disease, no death, no curse. There's joy unspeakable, filled with glory. And that's the plan for the earth. And we're the gatekeepers and we say, close the door on Satan and we open the door to the presence and the Spirit of God to move and confirm the word with signs following. We are the gatekeepers. We allow the, so the Zoe life of God. Jesus said, the thief has come to kill, to steal and to destroy. But I came that you might have life and life to the full. It's the Zoe life of God. We can live on earth as if we were in heaven. Wow, don't you think the unsaved are going to look and say, what is that person? I want that. Whatever they touch, it prospers. We are God's advertising campaign. And some of the church is a bad advertising campaign for God. And God's changing that around so that we're on the top, not the bottom, that we're lending to nations, not borrowing. And now there's nothing wrong with borrowing if you get the money to work for you. And so there's, don't, don't get religious like they think, oh, I can't buy a house, I've got to borrow. No, no, no. Just start out. Praise the Lord. And so we are the ones, what does it say? That we are the ones who allow or don't allow Satan. Sickness. Am I allowing that on my body? Now, I had an attack a few years ago of epilepsy came on my body and it didn't attack me during the day. It was attacking me at night and I was having seizures and they sent me to the C, you know, CT scans, all kinds of stuff. And it was interesting because Satan came in to attack me. He would attack me face to face con with consciousness. Bang, I'll slap him, but I, was, I would go to sleep and this thing would come and I would have, I have these seizures and just be totally unconscious and not very pleasant, obviously, for Stefan. Um, and I thought, how dare you, Satan? I'm sleeping and you're coming in to attack like that. And so I couldn't actually fend it off in this, in this situation like uh, Fergus, Fergus' wife so said she could feel him coming and, and hit that thing. And so um, I was just speaking the word and saying, thank you, Father, I shall lie down and I shall not be afraid. My sleep shall be sweet. My sleep shall be sweet. And so I just took a hold of that word and thought, no, I'm not going to go. They wanted, a, they wanted to diagnose me and, and on the records it says epilepsy. And I thought, no, Satan, how dare you come? And how dare you come at night time when I'm supposst to be resting and, 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 and bring on these full full on seizures, etc. Um, you know a, a couple of times they brought the ambulance because I'd, I'd be un, knocked un, you know gone unconscious and I can't remember anything. I mean Stephen's gone oh. <laughs> I mean Dale knows um, uh, and, that, and so um, I stood that, you know stood uh, with the word, took that word uh, for about you know just started to speak it for, for a year and continued to just stand on the word. And uh, last year, um, the doctor said, oh, so no, you're free. Gone off the records, as it were. You know, you no longer have um, epilepsy. And so, because, I, again, now you need to wait for a whole year to not have a seizure, etc. And so, uh, praise the Lord that I would not allow that. I could have gone under that and just thought, oh, well, that's my lot in life. No, no way. I'm not receiving that. That's not my heritage. I will not allow that. See, God says, whatever you allow, Vanessa, I'm going to have to allow it because I've given you the right of choice. I've given you the ability to decide how blessed you want to be, how high you want to climb, how much of my life you want to have. It's up to you. And so I took hold of what our, my word, of, of God's word, our inheritance, and stood. Now, many of you have done the same thing and just stood. We can allow sickness to come on us or we can just say no. No, Satan, I'm drawing a line in the sand. This is who I am in Jesus Christ. You see, we have the authority to stop the works of the enemy in our life. And that's why Jesus said, you start in Jerusalem, Judea, and the outermost parts of the world. So we start with ourselves. Start with our own personal life, our own personal world, our own mind, our own finances, our own children, and, that, and then go on from there. And just get the victory over areas in our lives and say, no, I'm not permitting this. I'm not allowing this in my life any longer. This is not what the Word of God says for me. This is not God's will for my life. Whatever you allow. Look at this scripture here. It says the same thing. Jesus repeating it in Matthew 18, 18. And the New Living Translation, so two chapters over. He says, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. You see, God is waiting to confirm our words. 
He's not going to confirm words that speak we, when we speak death. But I'll tell you who's going to confirm those words. Satan will make sure those things will come to pass. And so he says, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on the earth is going to be permitted in heaven. And so what are we permitting? It's up to us. You see, we are the guards of our lives. We're the guardian of our soul. We're the guardian of our finances. We're the guardian over our children. As I said, Jesus said, I've come to give you life. You take that life. You see, we just take a hold of the word. And so basically, how, how, how do I use that authority? How do I use the authority that God has given me? He's made me the, the gatekeeper. He's given me the keys. How do I use that? I speak the word exactly like God did. We take a hold of his word and we just start to declare that over our lives. And as I said, you may not see anything happening immediately, but then we don't walk by sight. The Bible says you walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by the word and not by the circumstances. When we understand that this word is eternal, that it lives and abides forever, then it doesn't matter what's happening in the natural. The natural is going to bow to the word of God. Everything in the natural came out of the spirit realm. This world was created by words and it can be adjusted by the words of our mouth. We are the gatekeepers. We hold the key. Whatever we allow, God has to allow. And so we speak life. Praise God. It's interesting. Some, you know, as I sort of said, some people say, well, you know, you know God's going to permit it. I hate that. I hate it. Uh, that, that's just a, an indictment on God and an indictment on what Jesus Christ has done when he raised us up together and made us sit together with him for the purpose that you shall rule in life by one Christ Jesus. That our God, he causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. Now look at this here. Ephesians, Paul, talking to us. He says, now neither give place to the devil. Now that word place, look at the word in, in the Greek. It's to, uh, topos, and it's interesting, this, it's, it says a, a specific, a mark off, marked off geographical location, territory, or a zone. So that word place means topos, or tupos, whatever you say, a specific marked off geographical location, a territory, or a zone. And so we get the word, the topographical map, from that word. And so Paul is saying, don't you give place don't you give any kind of territory to the devil. Don't give him a zone in your life. Don't give him anything. You see, Satan's looking for place. He's looking for a place. Like in the beginning, he was roaming around the earth looking for an entrance into the earth. Now, Satan is a spirit being and he is roaming. The Bible talks about him as a roaring lion. He is seeking out whom he's going to devour. That's what the word says. He's teaching. In fact, Jesus taught more about the devil than anybody else. They didn't teach about the devil in the Old Testament because in the Old Testament they didn't have authority over him. But in the New Testament there's a lot of teaching about the devil because now we have authority over him. There's no good God talking to the Old Testament saints about Satan when they didn't have the name of Jesus and they weren't born again. All it would do was frighten them. They knew of him, but they didn't have the teaching like we have in the New Testament. And so Jesus, the word says that Satan is walking around like a, like a roaring lion, he is seeking whom he may devour. He is looking for a place. He's looking for a territory. He wants all of it, but he's looking for an entrance. And our families and our children. Now, as we said, he couldn't get a hold of God in the beginning. God just kicked him out. And so he went after God's kids. And parents, we need to guard our children with our mouths. I don't care what your children are doing. We are not agreeing with the work of Satan in their lives, whether that's they're struggling with reading, struggling with fear, struggling with food, struggling with friendships. Whatever it is, we're not going to agree with those things that are happening in them. We're going to speak that our children are blessed, that us and our households are blessed, and start speaking life over those children. Those children are not naughty. It's a naughty thing that they've done. Train ourselves. When, when your mouth wants to say you... Uh, you slap yourself and you put a watch over your mouth and you guard it because they will test you. I'll tell you what, kids will push you to the limit. We all did it to our parents. So we sewed it, so now we're reaping it. 
<laughs> but I'll tell you what. In the Old Testament, they spoke blessing over their children. They knew the power of their words. And we know the power of our word to bless. And we're not going to allow Satan to come on in there because he's looking for a place. And if he can't get to you like he couldn't get to our Father God, then he's going to look for the kids. And so parents, you are the gatekeeper over your house. You hold the keys. Whatever you let in is let in. Whatever you say stays out, stays out. Whatever sickness or disease that Satan wants to put on your child so that they're going to live with that for the rest of their life, you're the gatekeeper. You say, no, they're not having asthma. They're not having that. And you put that gate up. You put that, that word out and you do that with the words of your mouth. And so he's looking for a territory. He's looking for an entrance. And what he will do is he'll come and contest the word. That's exactly what he did in the garden. Came to contest the word. Every generation he comes to contest, has God said? And so that's what he's doing. He's looking for that entrance. He knows what God has said. He knows that you're healed, that you're free, that you're prosperous, that you have not been given a spirit of fear, but you've got a spirit of power, love and a sound. He knows all of that. He can quote that. But he wants to know if you know it. And so he's just testing. And the Bible talks about fiery darts of the wicked that will come. And he talks about in Ephesians, he says, the shield of faith will quench those fiery darts. So when the enemy is coming around to have a look and trying to get into our world, we stick up the shield of faith. And what is the shield of faith? It is a bold confession of God's word. And we put that out there all around our household. Anything that belongs to us, our city, our schools, your schools that your children are in, speak the blessing, release the blessing over our schools because when that school is blessed, then your children are blessed. That's why God says, or, or Paul said, he says, you pray for the peace of the city. You pray for the governments and those that are in authority that you may lead what? A quiet and peaceable life in all godliness. For that is the will of God. And so when the city is in peace, the gospel can be shared. People are open. Praise the Lord. And so he's going to come and contest that word. And so what did Jesus say when he came to contest the word with him? Jesus just answered him, it's written. It is written, it is written, it is written. But we can't say what is written unless we know what's written. And so we've got to get in the book. And it's not legalism to read the word and get in the book. It's just that this is our word. This is our life. Jesus said man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so this word is food for my spirit. It renews my mind, but it feeds my spirit so I can stand. And I can declare who I am in Christ. And Satan may come in one way, but the Bible says he flees before me seven ways. Hallelujah. I mean, I just love that. Glory. So we meet Satan at the door of our world with the Word of God. The Word of God is the greatest weapon that we have. T.L. Osborne said that, actually. Old T.L. Osborne, he said that the Word of God is the greatest weapon that we have against the enemy. And man, did he make a dent in, in Africa. He spent his life over there declaring the Word of God and, and preaching re uh, revelation knowledge. So we give Satan no place. Look at this here. We're the doorkeepers. Look at, look at the scripture in Ecclesiastes. I love this. It says, where the, where the word of a king is, there is power. And so we are kings and priests. Peter, Peter says that, that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own special people, that we should show forth the praises of him that's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. It says, where the, king, where, the, where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say to him, what are you doing? So when we start speaking the word, and Satan comes and thinks, Lee, what are, you, what are you doing? What are you doing speaking the word? You just turn around and say, Satan, the word of a king has power. That's all. You just know who you are. What are you doing? I'm a king. I'm a priest. My words have power. I'm declaring it, and God is going to confirm that word with signs following. But, oh, it's not going to happen. Look, have you seen what it's looking like out there? It doesn't matter, Satan. I walk by faith and not by sight. I'm walking by the word, not by my senses. And you just keep pushing him back. Keep pushing him back. And so our authority is released with words. Look what God said to Jeremiah. And you find this all through the word once, once we just have a look. He sort of said, Jeremiah, God said, and this is a, a prophet in a, in a black, backslidden nation, and God spoke to Jeremiah the prophet and said, Jeremiah, I have put my words in your mouth 
See, I have set you this day over the kingdoms. What are you going to do? You're going to root out, you're going to pull down, you're going to destroy, you're going to throw down, then you're going to build and plant. And so God said, I put my words in your mouth, Jeremiah. I have set you over the kingdoms. You're going to root out, pull down, destroy, build and plant. And then God later on goes on to say, now Jeremiah, I'm watching over the word to perform it. And so God has said the same thing to us. He said, church, I put my word in your mouth. See, I have set you over the kingdoms. It is your responsibility to look at the earth, to look at your world, look at your neighborhood, root out, pull down, destroy anything that is not of my, not, not belonging to my kingdom, anything that doesn't represent me, abortions, whatever it is, whatever it is in the health areas of all the chemicals being released in our world. Some people are actually anointed by God to come and face the, um, the FDA in New Zealand, whoever that is, and start to fight and give their life to fight for the chemicals that are released into our earth. It's not God's will. It's killing people en masse. And so somebody's anointed of God to fight that battle. And so there's different fights that God gives us to stand, our families, but then there's giftings and callings to be in the world. We're in the world, but we're not of it. And we are there to root out, pull down, and destroy anything that does not, ha that does not represent the kingdom of God. And then what do we go do as the church? We go then and build and plant righteousness, peace, holiness. That's what we're there to do. You see, Jesus did the same thing. He used that word in his mouth. He spoke to sickness and commanded it to go. It went. He cast devils out. They left. He spoke to the fig tree and cursed it. It died. And so we have that same. He said, you having the same spirit of faith that you believe, therefore you speak. We have the same spirit of faith as our Father, God. He has given us his gift of faith that we believe and we speak. And we can turn our world around. We turn our life around, our children, our schools, our kingdom or our, I should say, our, our earth. We, we, we do that. So as the doorkeepers, we go around and we check the walls. Look at the scripture here. Just give us another five minutes and we'll, we'll close. Ecclesiastes 10.8. As the doorkeepers that we're going to check the walls, it says here, whoever breaks through a wall will be bitten by a serpent. Now we are the gatekeepers we're the doorkeepers, we hold the keys, we're the authority. And we just walk around our world and we just check it out. Is everything going all right? How's, how's the family? How's, how's my husband? How's my wife? How's the finances? You see, because as I said, Satan's looking for an entrance. He's looking for a part of the wall in your world that is broken down. He's watching your mouth to have a look and see, oh, I get tired all day. Hmm, she gets tired, okay. Put in there a migraine. Oh, oh. Watching the words of our mouth. We're looking at our children. How are they going? What are they watching? What are they exposed to? Who are the friends they're hanging around with? We are the gatekeepers. We're the guardians. And so we look around. Like Adam, he wasn't watching. And he let that thing in. He let, that, he let Satan entrance into the earth. And so we have a look here. We look for any weak areas, any broken down areas, stuff that we maybe shouldn't be watching. Now, I mean, God has got not a, not a problem with television. And I don't have a problem with television. I just don't have time to watch it. And then I don't want anybody else telling me what I want to think about or what I want to buy. I am the authority of my world, and I'll tell myself what I'm going to buy and what I'm going to think. You know, you listen to what, the songs that we're, that we're listening to. You know, give me the beat, boy. Lose, lose, what is it? Lose my soul. I want to get lost in the rock and roll. I don't, I don't want to get lost in rock and roll. What is that song? Give me the beat, boy. Need my soul. I want to get lost in the rock and roll and lose my soul. Something like that. Uh, drift, drift away. I don't want to drift away. And I don't want to get lost. You know, you grab a hold of some of these songs and you have a look. When we realize life and power is in the tongue. And whenever you love to speak, you're going to eat the fruit of that. You won't eat the fruit right now, but you are going to eat the fruit of that unless you turn it around. And so some of these songs that sound so cool, and the bad thing about it is that they've got such good beats to them, and so you know, you know, like this, you know and all of a sudden the person's lost. Yeah, and they think it's cool. No, no, no. I'm the guardian of my world. 
And so we have a look and just see what is out there in our world. Okay, God, is there things that I just need to clip off and cut off? You and God know. And Jesus said, he said, you're the vine, I'm the branches. He said, and if you want to bear fruit, he said, I'm going to have to prune you. He said, and if you can't be pruned, he said, you're not mine. And so there's certain things that the Holy Ghost will prune off of you because what is it doing? It's feeding death. It's actually made a break in your wall in your world and it's allowing Satan to come in and out. And when the serpent comes in, he will bite. And the thing is, when the gates are open and the walls are down and that bite comes in, oftentimes people will forget and, you know, like they speak death over themselves and speak negativity. And by the time they're in in this huge big mess, they've forgotten what started it. And two or three years before, they were speaking. I never have any money. I never have enough. It never goes well with me. And those seeds of death that have been planted in their lives. And so we're the guardians. We ensure, it says here, in Ezekiel, God saying, he says, I've looked for someone who might rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards the land. God is looking for a people In your own life, he's looking to see if you are going to rebuild the walls of righteousness. You see, those walls, they guard the land. Um, This message of righteousness, it guards our land. The word of God, it guards our land. And God says, I search for someone to stand in the gap in the wall. I look for someone to stand in the gap in the wall. These are amazing scriptures of word pictures and saying, Father God, here I am. Here's my mouth. I turn my mouth over to you. You know, when, Abraham, when Adam gave his, his, himself over to Satan, his, his tongue got set on fire from hell. But when we turned around and we gave ourselves to Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost came on and there was a fire from heaven came down and our mouth got set on fire from heaven. And whatever we say has got life in it. And we are those people that are right now, we can just say, Father God, you look for someone, or here I am. I'm right now rebuilding the walls of righteousness over my life, over my children, over my schools, over my city, over my nation. Now you imagine if the whole body of Christ started to do that, and she is starting to do that. She's starting to put the word of God in her mouth. I'll tell you what, the walls of righteousness over our beautiful, beautiful nation. You know when everyone's saying recession, the church is saying, no, New Zealand is blessed. When they're turning around and saying unemployment, we just say, no, there's, there's, there's work for every person in our nation. When they're saying, oh, look, there's a whole lot of people that haven't got houses, God has promised in the Old Testament, and we can take that promise, that he gives us lands and houses. And I'm speaking that over our church, that everyone in our church has houses, not just one. God doesn't want one. He wants you to have zzz on yours. He wants you having houses. And so one is not enough as far as God's concerned. And so you speak out what God has said. That is a wall of righteousness over our lives. And so that's our dream for the people in our church, that everyone has jobs, that everyone has their own house and has houses, lands and houses, and that God brings everyone to their wealthy place. And not only bring, but that we are living in that wealthy place is our confession, not just bringing, because it means if we bring, we're not there. Now is the time of salvation. And so here we go. So we make sure, how do we ensure that our walls are built? Daily speaking the word. Daily speaking, you can get the scriptures out from the Victory Program. I've made this prayer booklet that if you don't know how to speak the word of God yourself, the prayer booklet, seven days of prayer, that you can start speaking that out. And that's one way just to keep the walls built. You don't have to wait until the whole thing crumbles and starts, start to try and build it. No, you keep the walls built. And if there's a little flick in the wall, you just put the word in those areas and just keep on speaking the word of God over our lives. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. Have a look at Deuteronomy 28. If you, the book or the law will not depart out of your mouth, but you'll meditate in it day and life. He says, keep in the word and you'll be blessed. I mean, Deuteronomy is amazing. He talks about you being blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed coming in, blessed going out. I mean, you don't want to read the curse because we're not, we're not in the curse. The curse is not around our lives. He says, now this will diligently come to pass that if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all of his word that he commands you this day, that God will set you on high above all the nations of the earth and all these blessings will come upon you. All the blessings will overtake you. Hallelujah. Praise God. You see, the body of Christ, I've put here, as the body of Christ, we speak restoration into our cities and over our nation. Job 22:28 says that you shall decree a thing 
and it shall be established unto you. And righteousness will shine upon your path. You decree, that's the authority that we've been given, that we as the gatekeepers, that we have got the keys of the kingdom, the things that we don't allow on earth is the things that God's not going to allow. And our dad wants to look down on us and go, my goodness me, they think like I think. They're not allowing that in the earth. You think of our forefathers, you know, which was the Christian nation. You think of all the wonderful things that they set up in this nation that we've allowed those walls to fall down with abortion, with a whole lot of other things. Not giving a child the right to be able to make their own choice whether they want to live and die. We had people that fought for that. And you see, we, the church, have allowed that to that, that wall to be broken down. Allowed prostitution, prostitution to be legalized. You see, there was a time in, the, in New Zealand that that was not allowed. Why? Because there were some gatekeepers on this, on this, in, this, in this nation that said, no, we will not allow that in this nation. Now we've got little girls, 13, 12, 13, 14, being abused in that area. Why? The gatekeepers of the earth. And, and primarily God's looking at the church. And as the church shines and she takes her authority and says, no, we will not allow that in New Zealand. We love our little girls. We love our babies. God says, increase, multiply, fill the earth. We declare life over our wombs in our nation. We declare the life of God over those wombs in Jesus' name. We have the authority to do that. And as I said, initially we may not see a whole lot of stuff happening, but we keep on and pressure and keep pressure on the word of God in those areas and we will see them turn around. God will bring people into places of authority in our government that will fight for those things. God will raise up people to fight in those whole areas. Some people will just totally give their life and it will take a lifetime to fight and change a law. God has called them to do that. Praise the Lord. So, Father God, we just thank you right now, Lord God, that you've given us the authority. Lord God, the authority is released in your word, that we're the ones that open and we're the ones that shut. The one, we're the ones that say yes to things. We're the ones that say no. We thank you, Father God, that we take a hold of your word. We say yes right now to healing. We say yes to your prosperity. We say, yes, Lord God, that you've made us the head and not the tail, that you've made us above and not beneath. We say, yes, Lord God, that you've seated us in heavenly places. We say, yes, Lord God, that our children are blessed, that the fruit of our womb is blessed, that they are happy, they are prosperous, that they are to be envied. We say, yes, Lord God, that you've said that this church and this people are to be on top of the mountain, that we are exceedingly glorious, that we are to be famous in all the land. We say yes to inventions happening, Lord God, and being discovered in the people in this house. We thank you and we say yes to patents, Lord God, people just inventing things that, are, Lord God, are going to generate huge finances for the kingdom of God. We say yes, Lord God, to the overflow. We praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.